So we welcome, we welcome the panel. Uh, my great pleasure to introduce our second panel. Uh, Dr. Connie Sabor Price is the Chief Medical Officer of the Denver Health and Hospital. Uh, Dr. Jay Rappaport, Director of the National Primate Research Center at Tulane University. And Rear Admiral Stephen Ritt, Director of CDC Office of Public Health Preparedness and Response. Good to see you again, Director. Doctor, good to see you again. Uh, Dr. Price, if you would please commence. Is it on? Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, my name is Connie Price. I'm an infectious diseases physician who for 13 years before becoming chief medical officer served as the chief of infectious diseases and the healthcare epidemiologist at Denver Health, our uh, uh, county level one trauma public safety net institution in Denver, Colorado, and academic affiliate of the University of Colorado School of Medicine. Denver Health is also one of the nation's 10 designated regional Ebola treatment centers, um, and I now serve as chief medical officer for the institution. I'm telling you this because it colors a lot of my perspective of what I'm going to say today about uh, preparedness. Um, in addition to... Um, to my training background. Um, I also have some direct experience not only in thinking and ruling out Ebola and planning for Ebola in the hospital setting, but also as a frontline healthcare worker um, in 2003 in Toronto during the SARS epidemic. Um, I also investigated transmission of Middle East respiratory syndrome in hospitals in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Um, and have been a doctor through uh, several severe influenza seasons, including H1N1. Um, and as um, said before, I've had to consider even Ebola recently in my um, role as an infectious diseases physician at Denver Health. Uh, I've had the frustration of trying to create surveillance systems working with the CDC's Biosense system many years ago to try to help us better detect these incidences. So as I was saying, these experiences do color my thinking on both our strengths in preparedness as well as many vulnerabilities. And there are some common themes in all of these diseases, including SARS, MERS, Ebola, the, in, in, uh, influenza. First, uh, in a large scale event, the capacity of our healthcare system is inadequate. I think we all realize that and it's why we're here today. Um, hospitals in most large population centers run at near full capacity as a on a daily basis. It's part of the economics of how hospitals have to run to meet their margin. Uh, in addition to just having the available beds, uh, specific needs such as ventilators, isolation rooms, pharmaceuticals, and access to specialty care physicians also are inadequate to treat a large-scale event. So if hospitals are going to be adequately prepared in a community or region, they're going to have to work together. But how do you get competing entities to do that? These are largely pub public, my hospital's a public hospital, but many of the larger systems in Colorado are private entity, for-profit entities. And they are not typically interested in working with each other. They're accustomed to competing with each other. Um, and so we have to think about how to break down that barrier and uh, get everybody uh, working off the same script during a disaster. The other issue that's unique to communicable infectious diseases um, for hospitals is that they're communicable. And uh, there's a lot of resistance to accept a patient into your hospital, especially if they didn't originally present to you. Uh, and for good reason, transmission of communicable diseases in healthcare settings is amplified. We saw this from our experience in SARS. Where did the transmission occur in the more developed regions? It really was in healthcare settings. Ebola in the United States, same thing. That's where we saw the transmission. And it's because we do things to patients that artificially aerosolize infectious particles. Um, we have hundreds of contacts a day with healthcare professionals and the patients. And there's many opportunities to transmit that you wouldn't otherwise get in other settings. Um, in addition, the patients in the hospitals are sick. 
That usually correlates with a degree of infectious uh, viral load or uh, bacterial burden. So all of those things uh, contribute to the amplification in the healthcare setting. And then you put overburdened staff who are taking care of their routine patients on top of a surge of infectious patients. Um, they may then uh, end up breaking protocol in their isolation uh, per personal protective equipment, or PPE as I'll call it. So these are challenges, the practical challenges of dealing with um, these types of events. And preparedness takes time and resource. Without that return on invest in investment, um, you're not going to have hospitals invest in that capability. Um, you can mandate it, and you know you may get uh, the re typical response to an unfunded mandate, which is here. Here's our plan. It's 100 pages, and you know we've done two drills. Thank you very much. Now move on. Um, so we need to make this um, very real. But I think that, you know, even though these barriers sound daunting, and I don't mean to be completely negative, I think we have made progress. Um, we had the opportunity in Denver to test our response recently for, uh, to a suspected Ebola patient. So on a beautiful Sunday morning, um, of course it was a Sunday, uh, in July in, in, in Denver, all of us were sitting in either our bike gear or climbing gear or whatever and got a call about a 27-year-old male who presented to our emergency department with fever, nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. And he had reported recent travel to the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Now, he reported travel in an area that was not at that day, at that time, known to have recent Ebola transmission. Still, because of the way he presented, if he were to have Ebola, he would have been at a very highly infectious uh, timing of his, uh, of his illness, and we had no wiggle room to be wrong. So we uh, opted to rule him out, as we call it in uh, medical lingo, and um, bring him in to have a lab test and a full history and physical done. Uh, I can tell you, um, because of some of the resource we have had since 2014, remember I told you we're a regional Ebola treatment center, we've had resource for our nurses to do quarterly drills and our physicians to do quarterly drills on donning and doffing personal protective equipment. We've had resource to build our own uh, biocontainment unit uh, with a lab, with autoclave capabilities, um, with uh, transport pathways, with dedicated elevators, all of these things to be able to accommodate such a patient. And I was very pleased with the medical response in this event. Um, we feel we have gone a long way and uh, the, the structure put in place um, and the resources of the National Ebola uh, Training and Education Center really served us well. Um, where we have uh, really had difficulty is um, what Dr. Fink referenced is more in the communication and intersecting with our public health colleagues around who's in charge and how to communicate to reassure our public. This got a lot of attention, um, caused a lot of angst in our community. We were ready to communicate our negative test result by 1 p.m. that day. But because of a desire from three different public health agencies wanting to coordinate a response uh, and ha have a joint press release, we could not get all the approvals we needed to communicate something to our public until about 4 or 5 p.m., at which time then the other entity said, you know what, you guys just do it on your own. So we felt that that could have been much better. We could have been more reassuring and allowed um, others to go about their Sunday and enjoy that beautiful day and not be afraid of Ebola in their community. Um, many other lessons learned, and we can get to those in the Q&A session, but I want to give some time also to my other colleagues to give their opening statements. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Um, so I, I'm, in, I'm the uh, director of the Tulane National Primate Research Center. I've only been in this position since June, so I wanted to tell you how I came to have this position and what my, you know, and I appreciate the opportunity to 
present my perspectives. Um, I, the previous director, uh, Dr. Andrew Lackner, had passed away a year ago, April. He was director of the facility during the uh, outbreak of Burkholderia pseudomalii, which I think the panel is, is, is interested in. Uh, through, through that time and through uh, some years surrounding that, I, I actually had served on the NIH panels that had reviewed uh, all of the National Primate Research Centers with the exception of Tulane. So six out of the seven standing National Primate uh, Research Center. So that actually, I think, is why I was one of the candidates, or viable candidates. And in uh, and, and accepting this position, I also take responsibility of the select agent program, uh, biosafety, and, uh, you know, and I can give you my perspective on uh, the importance of, of biosafety, biosecurity, also non-human primate research, and our status of research, I think, with uh, in terms of what's going on in the rest of the world. So the, the incident that is in question occurred uh, November 2014 to February 2015. We had three animals that were three uh, rhesus macaques that were uh, inadvertently infected with uh, Burkholderia pseudomalii. Uh, these animals uh, were euthanized. Uh, the incident was reported. There was an extensive investigation by the USDA, CDC, EPA, and there was a multi-agency uh, investigation and response to the incident, uh, interacting with local officials uh, together with the, with the leadership and staff that was at, uh, at the Tulane National Primate Research Center. So we have a fairly secure environment. Uh, we are um, the only National Primate Center that has a regional biosafety laboratory with a select agent program. We have a number of select agents that are in use. Uh, this particular incident uh, led to some important lessons. Uh, one is that uh, we had to uh, really step up our levels of containment, our standard operating procedures that had to be robust and strict. Uh, Dr. Laura Levy, who, was the vice who is the vice president for research, hired uh, uh, Angie Birnbaum, who's, who's here with us today, uh, as director of biosafety uh, for Tulane. She managed the response to the incident, the investigation, and the response, and is now director of biocontainment with the regional biosafety laboratory there. So we had a, a massive response. We had, uh, we had to examine all of our procedures because it could not be ascertained what the specific step that led to this release of Burkholderia. So everything had to be looked at. Uh, so the entire program, the entire bi biosafety program was revamped, uh, revitalized, and, and went from something that was, you know, questionable based on the release to now that I think is probably the best uh, biosafety program in the nation and has really exemplary, exemplary status. So we actually have had our, uh, after 16 months, we've had our select agent status um, reinstated in 2016. Uh, in retrospect, we were very fortunate one, that it only had affected a few animals. Uh, it had not spread to any humans. It had not infected the water supply. We had tested the water, the soil. Uh, this agent can be found in, in water and soil, nor normally in, in Southeast Asia. It's not found in the United States. It was confirmed that this was a laboratory strain, so we do know uh, where it came from. But we were very fortunate that this incident had not caused uh, more, more of a problem, uh, you know, within within the animal population and also with the uh, with the human population in, in in the region. So this actually brings us to um, consequences uh, of and our vulnerability for the assessment uh, for for uh, future outbreaks. Um, all of the select agents, uh, with the exception of smallpox, come from wildlife come from animals. We don't really know when the next one is going to be. The H1N1 
uh, Zika. These are examples of the, the unknown unknowns. So it's very difficult to predict when the next uh, outbreak will be, and if, if it's not uh, really if, it's when. So my, my perspective, coming as a director of one of the National Primate Research Centers, and I've talked about this with all the other directors, we have weekly calls by telephone. We meet in person twice a year in meetings. We just had one. Um, so we are extremely under-resourced nationally regarding the ability of non-human primates for research, and this includes biodefense studies. Now, I say this is extremely important because the nature of these agents, the nature of select agents is such that the medical countermeasures that are developed cannot be tested in humans. They have to be tested in animals. And the non-human primates are the quintessential, most translatable, most valuable asset in terms of research relative related to to such an outbreak. There was recently a uh, needs assessment performed by the NIH, a survey done by Sherry Hill uh, from, uh, uh, from OREP. And the conclusions which are being written now are that we are extremely under-resourced with non-human primates. There are certain species that I can tell you about probably in the next three to five years, will we'll be 10 to 20 percent under-resourced in rhesus macaques. Um, and this does not include, this includes just normal research grants, you know, the, the normal day-to-day. -day. It does not include the surge or, or um, an, an outbreak of consequence, which would divert and necessitate the commandeering at this point of non-human <coughs> primate research. The biosafety level four facilities that we have in this country are few and have very little space. It's been proposed that we should use small monkeys in these facilities, such as marmosets or cinemologous monkeys. Marmosets right now are extremely rare. There's a demand for them for gene editing studies. A few years ago, nobody knew what to do with them. Now you can't get them because gene editing studies, the ability to manipulate DNA, to create transgenic animals, to, in, to cure mutations or to create mutations has caused an extreme demand for these. So a lot of these are in matings now to produce more and you can't really, um, they're, they're in really short supply for research. The cinemologous monkeys or, or crab-eating macaques are almost exclusively coming from China. China is selling sinos at lower prices than we can generate them. They're also luring U.S. investigators and some Chinese investigators that came over in the 80s and 90s back to China because they're building enormous non-human primate facilities capable of doing non-human primate research, and also with the ability to do gene editing studies. They're charging so small amounts of money. Here it may cost $6,000 for a sino, over there it's $1,500. So they are luring investigators over there. This is going to be a drain on our intellectual capital, okay, and it's also going to be uh, some investigators are worried that we, in the future we will not have the appropriate models here to work with. Now, I know tariffs aren't going to do it because that will not prevent investigators from going to China, and I'm not in favor of, of, of taxing uh, this support of research. But we have to think about how, how we subsidize our research enterprise. Right now, studies with, res with rhesus macaques, or with monkeys in general, non-human primate research right now is about 1% of the total NIH budget. If you look at the National Primate Research Centers, who really supply the infrastructure for basic research for, for, uh, for non-human primates, we're probably talking about point, uh, less than a quarter of a percent 
So we're talking about fairly small, relatively uh, small amounts of money. But nevertheless, the NIH budget has increased 5% this year to 2019 and probably, uh, you know, about, you know, 4 to 5% over the past few years. Nevertheless, the 90-minute the primate research centers have not received an increase. Their budget has been basically flat. And in, in terms of inflation-adjusted dollars, we're actually losing ground. We're supporting more and more research in R01 grants, program projects, contracts that we do for the, for the NIH. Uh, we have a vaccine evaluation unit. We do contracts uh, for AIDS vaccines. You know, we do quite a bit of, of research. That research is increasing. But the infrastructure, the money we have for our infrastructure uh, remains flat or is decreasing. During the sequestration, 2013, uh, the, the New England Primate Center was closed. That was, that was one of the initial eight. The funds for the, re, for the New England Primate Center was not distributed to the other seven, despite the fact that we that many of the resources were distributed. There was some funds that were distributed on a one-time basis. But that sequestration, actually, if you look on the graph, I don't have slides to show you, but that actually caused a dip in the funding to, to the national uh, primate centers. So I, I think that um, when we think about it, um, it we're, we're, we really need to uh, take action here. Uh, the pharmaceutical industry, we've talked about the private sector, pharmaceutical industry almost exclusively uses synomologous macaques. Right now, none of the non-human national primate centers are breeding them. We have an epidemic coming for Alzheimer's disease. It's not another issue, but uh, African green monkeys are probably the best model, and none of the non-human primate centers are breeding them right now. It takes time to establish these colonies, to have the appropriate number of animals in breeding, and to have the animals available to do uh, studies on demand as what happened uh, during, during um, an attack. So I think our, we're quite vulnerable now in terms of our position in the world, given what's going on globally, the fact that our pharmaceutical industry is dependent on China. Studies done in China require specifications of products introduced into these animals to the point that they will be able to acquire the intellectual or, or let's say, steal the intellectual property, okay, that would not happen in studies in the United States where studies, such studies can become, um, which can be done uh, more more con confidentially, so I, th I think we're we're really at a, at a tipping point, and we need to take uh, some actions here. Um, so I, I have some uh, recommendations, and I, I know that you know we were asked to come up with some actionable items, and these require funding. One is the funding for the regional biosafety laboratories. These were put up. Um, 10 years ago or so over, you know, the concerns over biosafety, uh, thanks to the concerns of this panel and, and, and others. Um, we have, there are 13 regional biosafety laboratories, 11 of them uh, use rodents. There are two that use non-human primates. We are one, the other one is in Pittsburgh. The regional biosafety laboratories were their construction was supported by uh, federal dollars. There are no dollars available for the maintenance of those facilities. And these facilities are extremely complex and difficult and expensive to maintain. Ours is a single floor, but there's a floor above it we call the penthouse. And if you go in there, all you see is duct work, uh, okay, and, and HVAC systems controls. There's incredible redundancy that's built into these systems. If the airflow were to stop, for example, and we're using an agent, let's say Burkle Barrio or tuberculosis, which we use, we have a, we have a, 
a, a system where, where uh, we can create aerosols and expose animals to aerosols and infect them by in aerosol chambers. If the airflow were to stop, we would have a risk of release infection of the people within the facility. So there are multiple redundancies built in that are tested under conditions of failure. And this is a, a very expensive uh, to, to, uh, to maintain. We are actually in a better position than some of the other regional biosafety laboratories because located at Tulane, we have quite a bit of additional research support. We have access to other funds available that we have been able to uh, do a better job in supporting this, a lot better than the freestanding regional biosafety laboratories. So my recommendations for this is one, is to provide financial support through the Department of Defense to support strategic reserves. This, this is actually for the uh, non-human primates, and the actual cost of this would be $40 million to increase, to have a, a non-human primate reserve. And I came up with this figure based on what the cost of the base grant is for the what we call the P-51s that support uh, the non-human primate centers. And this would be, let's say, a 50% uh, uh, inc increase on the base grant that would allow an, an increase in the number of animals should there be a, an outbreak that uh, such animals would be available. What was the dollar figure? It was uh, $40 million. Okay. Additional support for biosafety operations and facilities for, for select agent uh, laboratories based on size, complexity, and risk. This is 20 million. I think we're probably spending at least 2 million on ours. And I would, and ours I think is the largest, has the largest capacity, and is the most complex. Uh, and then I would ask for an additional funds for select agent research for uh, as of $100 million, $100 million. This is all annual cost. Uh, I think to, without the continued funding for select agent research, there are quite a few organizations, academic institutions that are just dropping their select agent programs because these are also expensive to run. So, uh, you know, I, I, we need the intellectual capacity, we need the continuous uh, research, improvement, we need to have scientists engaged in select, in select agent problems, and they'll all, they and their staff would then be trained to do such research. So without continuous funding, I think a lot of this, this infrastructure is in jeopardy. Um, so that gives you a cost of 160 million total annual, and 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 I'd also like to say that we need to engage our biosafety professionals more in terms of the responses that we see, not only in the research setting but in the hospital setting. As as uh, Dr. Price mentioned, a lot of the transmission you see is in the hospitals. Biosafety professionals are a lot more let's say, have, have the better training to train others in, in these practices. Um, and uh, I think I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Governor. And um, it's a pleasure to be here this afternoon. Um, and I wanted to start by just um, commending the work of the Blue Ribbon Panel. I, I think it is very, um, very important to have voices outside of government continuing uh, to maintain the focus on uh, being ready for health emergencies, whether they are from natural sources, uh, by accident, or um, by intention. Um, our work at CDC um, is intended to prevent these kinds of events when that's possible, when that is not possible, or we don't prevent the event, to make sure that we've got the earliest possible um, detection and response capability. What, um, what I will um, talk about today is uh, the H1N1 response. I was the, uh, the incident commander for that response, 
and I'll um, reflect a little bit on what we learned through that event, what we have corrected, and then some reflections just kind of from a larger picture of how we need to think about these uh, large-scale responses. Um, first, the um, events like H1N1, Ebola, and Zika uh, are going to continue to occur and uh, will, over time, um, occur more frequently because of trends that are, um, are evident today. Uh, much more global travel, uh, growth in the world's population, particularly in cities. Uh, the number of cities with populations over 10 million was 2 million in 1960. It'll probably be in the range of 40 million in the next decade. Uh, sorry, four, not 40 million, 40 cities. Um, uh, that growth is occurring in urban areas, and much of that growth, virtually all of it in African cities, is among people who are very poor. Um, the um, the likelihood of coming into contact with animals is also increasing with the number of uh, poultry and swine increasing. There's a chance of contacting domesticated animals and encroachment on wilderness areas can lead to outbreaks uh, like we're seeing in the uh, Democratic Republic of Congo right now. Uh, the last trend that I would point out is the availability of communication technology. Overall, that's great that we can communicate around the world quickly and at almost no cost, but it also um, increases or makes the spread of violent uh, ideologies much easier. Uh, we've heard also about the ease of spreading misinformation. So these are things that are um, making um, emergencies um, more likely and more difficult to manage. Um, but let me, um, let me take us back to 2005. Um, that was um, when the uh, threat of a global pandemic was really highlighted by the Bush administration and some very important preparatory measures were undertaken. Um, the um, H5N1 influenza virus was uh, spreading from East Asia south to Indonesia and west uh, through Asia into Africa and the um, the U.S. government led a really global effort to be prepared. Uh, the UN, uh, the World Health Organization, there was a, a, a body called the International Partnership on Avian and Pandemic Influenza. Uh, there was also very intensive work with, um, with state governments and state health departments to get ready. Secretary Levitt traveled to every state to meet with governors and encourage preparation. His message was that the federal government will help, but in a severe pandemic, there's not the possibility of uh, focusing uh, human and financial resources, and so, so states needed to be ready to, uh, to uh, respond on their own. A, a national strategy for pandemic influenza was published in November 2005. An implementation plan was published the following May, uh, and there was very uh, detailed follow-up on the 320 deliverables with public reporting periodically. Uh, there was substantial funding just, just for CDC on the range of a billion and a half dollars for pandemic preparedness, and that was in addition to work after 9-11 and the anthrax attacks to be ready for, uh, for public health emergencies. We undertook an intensive uh, planning and exercise process in 2007 and in 2008, we conducted five functional exercises. These were 24-hour-a-day uh, exercises where we practiced what we thought a severe influenza pandemic would look like, um, including mock uh, press interviews, uh, notional conversations with the World Health Organization, with officials uh, high in government, and with state health officers. Um, and in fact, we were planning a a, a sixth functional exercise for the spring of 2009 uh, when uh, the H1N1 virus was, uh, was identified. Uh, we had planned that the virus, the pandemic, would start outside of the United States and we would have time to characterize the severity and the transmissibility, but um, as we know, uh, that's not what happened. Uh, we, um, we first identified the virus at a weekly pandemic preparedness meeting that took place at CDC. It was on a Wednesday morning, kind of the end of the meeting. 
uh, someone from the lab on the phone called at a 10-year-old uh, boy in Southern California had been diagnosed with a, a virus that hadn't been seen before. It was actually part of a, uh, a clinical study done by the Navy on a prototype diagnostic device. The device would identify flu viruses within 30 minutes, and it gave a positive test for flu, but none of the seasonal viruses. So at CDC, we genotyped that virus and found that it was a swine, it was related to swine influenza viruses that had last been seen about 10 years before. And it was really, people didn't know what to make of it. They, we expected that there'd be an investigation and there would be an exposure to swine at a petting zoo or, or something. Uh, the next day, uh, sorry, on Friday, two days later, a second case was identified, and this individual did not have any contact with the first individual, and by that time, we knew that ne neither of them up till had, had any exposure to swine, so we knew something was up. Uh, we decided to publish a report on these two cases, uh, and that was done on the following Tuesday, so six days later. Um, as we were publishing that, cases were identified in Texas, and um, on the Thursday, eight days after the initial detection, we got a report from Canada that uh, severely ill individuals from Mexico had been diagnosed as being infected with that same virus. Six deaths, 10 people in hospital, and that led to a um, a call with uh, the White House and with uh, uh, people in the Department of Health and Human Services. And there were two questions that came up on that call. The first was, how bad is it going to be? And the second is, what are we going to do? I actually think these are probably the same questions that would come up in any event. Um, they weren't things that we had actually practiced answering in our exercises. Um, Rich Besser answered the first question. He said it was an eight on a scale of one to 10. Now, no one knew really. We had um, severe cases in Mexico, a handful of very mild cases in the US. Uh, but he, in, later he said he, he gave that number because he knew it would get people's attention. Um, the second question was what are we going to do? And I answered that question and it, it seems kind of obvious now, but at the moment of getting that question, it wasn't so obvious. Um, my answer was that we would work to understand the severity and transmissibility, kind of how this question of we needed to learn more to be able to really answer the first question. Um, the, second, um, the second thing we would do is we would implement individual control measures. In fact, we'd already done some of that, recommendations for drug treatment, for um, personal protective equipment, hand washing, cover, covering coughs. And we would begin to implement community measures, uh, begin to develop a vaccine, uh, make decisions about whether schools should be closed or not, and um, a process of notifying uh, travelers to countries and locations where cases were occurring. There were many, many decisions that were needed in those first couple of weeks of the event. Uh, and I think that's also a characteristic of these kinds of events is that most of the important decisions have to be made before you have all the information. Uh, and there's also a lag between making the decision and being able to implement it. In, in the case of vaccine production, we started production of a vaccine in April and weren't able, didn't have vaccine to deliver until October 5th. I'm now gonna just skip to the end. Um, there were 60 million cases in the U.S., 12, a uh, little bit more than 12,000 deaths, 10% of those in children. Uh, we were able to vaccinate 81 million people and probably could have vac vaccinated more except the peak of vaccine availability occurred after the peak of disease. Uh, those efforts prevented 10 million cases and 1,500 deaths. So what we learned from H1N1, um, first thing was that our everyday public health systems provided the foundation for the response. Two quick examples, the system that we used to track the disease was the same system that we use for seasonal influenza year, year after year. 
Um, our system to distribute vaccine was built on the system that's used to uh, ship vaccines for children. Vastly augmented, but basically using that same system. Second uh, major lesson, it's been talked about a little bit, uh, communication was a, a major, major effort. And the aim of that communication was to sustain trust that the government response was effective and that we were being truthful when things didn't go well and when they, um, when they did go well. Uh, med third, medical countermeasures are a key capability. The, the vaccine, the time to produce vaccine, its effectiveness, uh, were not what we would hope for, and antiviral drugs, that we had them in abundance, but they're not as effective as we would like them to be. Um, lastly, um, preparation paid off. It, it, there was some mention about the use of the incident command system, how that wasn't used in the anthrax event. Uh, for in H1N1, we had a practiced incident command system that we used. It really uh, facilitated uh, internal um, awareness so that we knew the facts that we knew. Um, in terms of things that have been corrected um, since, the, uh, since the H1N1 epidemic, we have, um, we have better tools. Uh, we have, uh, we have sh sh taken weeks off of the time from beginning vaccine production to having it available and through work primarily from Bar through BARDA, we're able to make much larger quantities of vaccine. Um, we still need um, better influenza vaccines, vaccines that would be more effective, longer lasting, and would um, be effective against a broader, broader number of strains where we don't have to make it each time for, um, for each strain that emerges. Um, we've developed better means of distributing countermeasures uh, we have worked closely to uh, increase the throughput of vaccination, primarily by being able to vaccinate at pharmacies. Uh, we just don't have enough providers without pharmacies to be able to vaccinate the number of people and the number of doses that we would need to in a severe pandemic. Um, and we have also worked to establish a system of telephone, telephone prescribing for antiviral drugs that could be used in a severe pandemic, again, to uh, increase the capacity for drug treatment. We've also worked hard to understand the information that we have so that in those early days uh, when a pandemic is uh, beginning, we can organize the information that we have and compare it to other, either other pandemics or other seasons of influenza. Um, just to close now with some overarching lessons. Uh, in events like this, it is very important to question implicit assumptions. And the one that I would point out in H1N1 was um, we were using the same methods to produce uh, influenza vaccine. They were used for seasonal influenza vaccine. And so we assumed that there would be a certain rate of production. And that turned out to be a false assumption that we really, we were, we were looking at it and we were watching it, but this, this bias that there's going to be about this much vaccine produced per egg uh, was, was hard, to, hard to disabuse ourselves of. Um, I'd say also when events like this occur, we need a combination of um, humility and confidence. And in this, from the standpoint of humility, uh, we need to recognize that initially we're not really going to know what the situation is, and it is possible that a very, um, a very bad influenza pandemic it would be catastrophic regardless of how effective our response is. Um, until we can actually prevent a pandemic from occurring, uh, it, it could be a really bad thing. Uh, I think we have to have confidence to know, to know what we know and take action even when all the information isn't available. Uh, third item here is that overwhelming events will require teamwork across agencies and across sectors. And the best thing that we can do in the short term to improve that is to exercise and make sure that we're making uh, improvements based on those exercises. Um, and lastly, very, this is the very final thing, uh, we, uh, we need to be able to measure our capabilities to be able to 
say with confidence where we're improving and where we're not improving. There have been several efforts in the last five years to improve our ability to understand exactly where we are. And I think that those are very important benchmarks to help us really understand how much more we need to do. Thanks very much. Thank you. Senator Dash. Thank you, Governor. Senator Dash. <laughs> Dr. Rudd, let me just pick up where you where you uh, left off with your last comment about measurement. I, you know, we've, we're, we're, we're talking today about the progress to the extent we've made progress over the last 17 years since the anthrax uh, experience uh, in 2001. You all have come to the table with enormous uh, wealth of experience uh, with insights and with uh, with a judgment that has been based on that experience and uh, and your uh, your views as you've learned from them, we haven't talked much today yet about the national strategy for biodefense, um, and I, I would really love to get based on your experience and your judgment uh, what progress you think we've actually made. I, I frankly, I'm somewhat pessimistic that we haven't come nearly as far as I wish we would have in the last 17 years. On a scale of one to 10, I'd give us about a four. Maybe you can disabuse me of that, uh, that ranking, but I think it takes three things. It takes first, real leadership. We've had it sporadically, we haven't had it consistently. It takes an enormous amount of coordination and we've had that uh, occasionally, not consistently. And it takes resources. Uh, we don't have the resources applied. Uh, and, and so I, I think the real question is, as we measure where we are today, realistically, uh, have we adequately prepared? Are we adequately uh, 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 capable of addressing a, a, a catastrophic experience uh, way beyond what, what we did with the anthrax uh, in 2001? Um, to whatever extent you can give me, give us your judgment around those questions uh, as we, as we now apply this new national strategy on biodefense. Uh, I'd love to have your insights. Maybe we'll just go down the line, and that'll be my only question. Yeah, I uh, I agree with your assessment. I do think we've made some strides uh, since two thousand one. Uh, and I guess I'm intrigued with each time we deal with these issues, we have, we've learned lessons, how well we've applied them well, we still have that opportunity. Um, so, uh, you know, one of the, the structure that I thought served us well in our um, Ebola scare was this concept of regional preparedness centers and sort of a tiered system where you have uh, frontline health facilities that really should be able to evaluate or um, suspect a uh, potential communicable disease coming into the facility and could take care of a high consequence pathogen for 24 hours. Then you have your treatment or your assessment hospitals that could take care of a patient for a little bit longer, maybe up to five days, resource and capability up to that point. And then your treatment centers and regional treatment centers that could really uh, take care of the patients for the whole duration. Um, for something that is a smaller scale, like an Ebola, maybe even like a SARS, I think that structure would work. Um, when we're dealing with like an H1N1 though, I mean that would be so widespread that really that structure then becomes more of a resource structure where the treatment centers can maybe inform and um, provide guidance or, you know, telephonic consultation with specialty support, something like that, to uh, other hospitals because everybody's gonna have to take care of patients. And so, I, you know, I think it, we do have to recognize first what kind, you know, are we planning for, what kind of events we're planning for and really put realistic plans in for the type of event that's most likely and that we're more, more likely to see, is it widespread like um, the H1N1, or are we really worried more about those really high consequence infectious pathogens where we have to detect that first case and, um, you know, uh, 
take care of them and prevent transmission. Yeah, thank you. I, I agree with uh, what uh, Dr. Price said. I think we we have made strides. Um, I think we've we've uh, we've come some distance. We have a ways to go. Uh, I think Vince Lombardi said, "If you strive for uh, perfection, you'll achieve excellence." So I think it's nice to really set the bar high, and hopefully we'll we'll get as as high as we can. Uh, there are a lot of things we can do. I come at this from uh, you know, from the research area and development of, of, of the, the medical countermeasures, um, you know, I, I think we need to do um, more, as I said, more support for non-human primates. I think we need to do uh, comparisons of various platforms for vaccines, for example, DNA vaccines versus protein vaccines versus, you know, viral vectors, killed vaccines, live vaccines. I mean, I think in terms of influenza, it's basically a combinatorial problem. There's only so many hemagglutinins and so many neuraminidases, H's and N's, and whatever the combination is, that's what you have. So um, to generate the proper combination is, uh, you know, there, there, there may be possibilities to do that fairly, fairly simply, uh, including multiple uh, hemagglutins, multiple neuraminidases in the same vaccine, or to generate them rather quickly in, in, a, in a platform like DNA vaccine would allow. So I think there's, there could be some research to, to compare those and, and try to see which would be the most rapidly deployed in the case of, of such, a, such an event. Oh, stop, uh, yeah, thanks. So in, t in terms of what has been accomplished uh, there, a huge amount has been accomplished since 9-11 uh, since and the anthrax attacks. It, just looking at what state capabilities have been built, every state has an in incident command structure, an emergency operations center. They are linked with their emergency management um, staff so that there's much, much better coordination within state governments. The, the, we've talked about the laboratory response network, so there's that ability to make laboratory diagnoses that didn't exist before, or before the pre-9-11 period. Uh, there also are um, substantial staff in state and local government available to respond that weren't, weren't there uh, beforehand. Uh, we've made strides in uh, the dispensing mission when medical countermeasures are delivered to a jurisdiction there are plans that have been exercised as to how to do that. There uh, are also, there's also been important gains in the ability to communicate that are tested regularly. Uh, there also are systems to measure those capabilities. I'll point out two. One is the National Health Security Preparedness Index. It's an annual review external to the government measure, that measures each state's capabilities in a number of domains. Um, at CDC, we are working with states to measure their operational readiness. There's a, a questionnaire and then a site visit to make sure that those plans and exercises are uh, available to demonstrate capability. Um, so I think, I think we've made a lot of progress. I, I think this is not something that we're ever going to be at a point where we say we are prepared. It's really uh, measuring where we are and building capabilities where we need those and then sustaining them. So I think there is a kind of a, a capital procurement that's that creating that capability and then making sure it's sustained on an ongoing basis. Yes, um, Admiral Red, um, thank you for your presentation. Um, and as you know, I worked on the flu preparation plan with you and, uh, and the implementation. And I was quite uh, pleased with the success we had in limiting H1N1. Uh, but the numbers you talk about in terms of um, there were between 10 and 15,000 deaths, I believe, and you say that our efforts uh, uh, or the government's efforts prevented another 1,500 deaths. Uh, if you look at this year, we had almost 80,000 deaths from flu, and the typical year is about 36,000 deaths. Do you think that H1N1 was an example of a successful response that limited the number of deaths, or do you think it just wasn't really the eight that uh, Dr. Besser had feared it would be? Um, I think it turned out not to be an eight. That, that would be one thing. I, I think that the, the measure of success was uh, largely that we were able to maintain the trust of the public. 
and, and that was not by saying it was going to be worse than it turned out to be, but, but by ongoing communication about what we knew about the severity, what we were doing, what members of the public should do. Uh, we actually had, uh, in the summer of 2009, we invited media to CDC for a week-long media boot camp to teach them about influenza. And, I you know, I think there's not many events that have a, a beginning and then a lull and then, a, then an increase, but I think that that was a great opportunity to really tell people what we thought was going to happen and what, what we as the government would do. Yeah, that, that's a really excellent point. I just want to make one, one quick follow-up, which is if you all remember that this took place in March of 2009 when we just had a new government, and at that point, for a variety of reasons, there was not a single confirmed political official at HHS at that point. And so the career staff really did a tremendous job in that communication in showing a kind of um, a, a government spirit and showing that, th that they were in charge and they had the expertise and it really was a, 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 an example of the system working well even in a period of transition and flux. Uh, Dr. Rappaport, uh, first of all, on a personal note, uh, I noticed you work at the Lewis Katz School of Medicine at Temple. Lou was a a great personal friend of mine, an extraordinary philanthropist, and uh, I suspect your association was even in a personal and professional way deeper than mine. He was quite a remarkable man, wasn't he? He, he sure was, and we're very grateful that you know he endowed the, the yeah. School of Medicine, and, and he really changed things there so much for the better. Yeah, yeah. No, no yeah. question about yeah. it. Yes, yes. Uh, given your work in uh, with HIV and with primates, just a person to ask this question. I read articles from time to time that tell me that uh, computers and artificial intelligence can ultimately substitute for the kind of work you do on primates and other animals. And I'd like you to, uh, I'd like you to address that from your, your experience. Okay, from, from my it's a pretty open-ended question, so okay, take I, it wherever you want to go. Okay, um, I, I just give you a, an interesting story. In 1995, when the first protease inhibitor was discovered, um, David Ho was on the was on the cover of Time, Man of the Year. HIV was cured, okay, because their mathematical models predicted that if a patient was on antiretroviral therapy long enough, the virus would be extinguished. This was all based on calculations, mathematical models. So I think when you, what you put into the computer and what is is <laughs> really determines what you get out, and a lot of it is based on your assumptions. If your assumptions aren't correct, then you're not going to get the right information. Right now, I, even with HIV, I think we're lacking the full information. And more and more information is coming every day in terms of what the best methods are for cure, vaccines. And so, I, I, you know, I, right now I don't see that the computer is taking over because we would have to input to them the, the, all of the correct assumptions and all the information the computer needs to know and still we're we're trying to figure it out when the computers can start doing experiments and start coming up with hypotheses and testing them and i know there's something called machine learning but i there's still programming involved there and you know we're still driving the ship with that so right now i think uh we're <laughs> it's it's uh it's dependent on us to do the research and you know and, and use the computers as we can to test hypotheses. Yeah, I, I appreciate the candor. I, I, I thought about that in terms of everybody thinks they can run. I mean, it's, it's an exciting world uh, for science and technology and the collaboration, but uh, I guess I personally wouldn't want to rely on it exclusively for any medical countermeasure. I'd rather, uh, the combination of both will serve the country well, I would yes, presume. Absolutely. absolutely. I appreciate that. Absolutely. Uh, Dr. Price, you said something very interesting, and I made note of it. You were out, the team was out in a nice July day. You got a bunch of calls, but there was no wiggle room. I like that, no, no wiggle. wiggle room. Uh, to be, get the diagnosis wrong. Now, you were at a regional Ebola treatment center at the time, so that center, and you, because of your experience, and apparently several other people there, everybody pretty confident you weren't gonna get it wrong, and you didn't. So the question becomes, one, do all the regional centers, be it for Ebola, or and I'd like to know if there are other pathogens, have people such yourself and people with the experience in these 
particular specialties, uh, and is that how a either regional set, treatment center is, is created, or do they place the specialists such as yourself to create a, 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 a center of excellence? Yeah, so we had to apply to be a regional treatment center, and as part of that, we had to have the capability, so the, the specialists, the ability to diagnose, and, and um, those resources. Um, and part of what we uh, need to do, I think, better going forward, should this structure continue, is the outreach to our rural hospitals to provide, to, to teach them how to identify, you know, some methods they can use. And even just everyday infection prevention as sort of their backup. Um, so for instance, um, you don't have to be an ID specialist to know that if a patient comes in with a cough and fever, you don't want it, whether it's SARS or whether it's just the common cold. And can we start moving all of us as healthcare providers on the front lines to a paradigm where this is just our routine, that we have this approach to evaluating patients as sort of that backup measure. I think that's what we need to start working with all of our community counterparts on. I mean, the analogy would be pre-HIV days. Remember, we used to draw blood without gloves. You can't even, it would feel funny to do that now. Um, and I think we should start thinking about it for other high, you know, just high consequence infectious diseases and just the regular everyday infectious diseases we don't want. I appreciate that. Unfortunately, we've got such a time crunch, but we appreciate this panel's your contribution to our discussion. And thank you again for your broader service to the, the broader community, not just in your individual communities, but to the country. Thank you very, very much, Admiral. Thank you. Thank you.